So I'm going to dive into this next, uh, it's such a cool session. Um, so this year, earlier this year, um, you know, every once in a while I have time to read. And I went on to um, uh, Moby Health News and there was an article that Neil, who I'm going to introduce in a second, wrote and it talked about, you know, exactly what the session is, which is about loudmouth patients. And I was worried that they might take offense to it. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember saying, do you think they will hate this title? But uh, what excites me about the title is that they are making a difference and they're making change. And what's exciting about the platforms that are out there now is that they are being given the ability to speak their mind and also connect. So that's what this session is about. I'm sure there's a, it, it's probably about a lot more and so I'm sure they'll mm -hmm. dive into it. But those were some of the, the driving forces about, uh, about this session. So I will not hesitate to introduce you to Neil Vercel. He's a freelance journalist and a contributor. Um, at, he's at Moby Health News and Universal. That's my, com that's my own company. That's his own company. Okay. Yeah, no, I know. I just yeah, didn't yeah. want to okay. pronounce it correctly. Okay. <laughs> Media. And uh, in, uh, we, we asked him about being a journalist. He said, I would not like to be anything else. If for no other reason than I'd rather drink with journalists. Another reason why I got into journalism, you don't have to get up in the morning. That quote's actually from Hunter S. Thompson, not from me. So, but, uh, Except at CES, you got to get up early. Exa well, <laughs> that's true, yeah. Okay. So I wanted to start, actually, by showing a, a quick video from Seinfeld. This is almost 20 years old, and yet it's pretty much right on the money. Go ahead and play it. Back up, okay. Not found? found? We could act it out. We can act it out. <laughs> okay, well the gist of it is, Elaine is at the doctor's office, the chart is sitting there, paper chart of course, this is, you know, not mid-90s. Looked in there and it said that this, uh, her doctor had written a note that she's a difficult patient. And she asked, questioned the doctor about that, and said, well, you know, I'll just erase it right here. And she's like, you wrote it in pen. And it goes yeah. on for quite a bit. I actually posted that on my blog earlier this week, posted the video on my blog earlier this week, and uh, along with a little preview of this session, <laughs> and next slide please, is a comment that I got anonymously from somebody claiming to be a doctor who uh, f thinks that the e-patient movement is a joke and that it's always about e-patient Dave and nobody else. Well, this panel will show that it's not just e-patient Dave, in fact, Donna, if you want to would you mind showing the back of your jacket? Sure. Uh, are you familiar with the walk-in gallery, uh, Regina Holliday's? Mm -hmm. She's painted, uh, you know, she is an empowered patient herself because she, her husband died of cancer, left her with two small children. Uh, she was not able to get information. It was just such a very big hassle. Well, she's channeled her artistic talent into the walking gallery. She's now, I think, passed 300 of these jackets uh, for various people who have had challenges with the healthcare, within the healthcare industry, illustrating their stories. And Donna's jacket is, is one, and I know there are some others here in the audience as well. Uh, Les, uh, Legia Rich already had one, is she, is she still here? No, there, were, well, there were a few others who were wearing okay, it. And there are a few others still walking around with it. But anyway, I wanted to, quickly go into somebody who is happy to be a disruptive patient, but only because he, you know, his life depends on it, and that's uh, Hugo Campos, who has an implanted pacemaker, and he's been fighting for several years with Medtronic just to get the data from the device that's implanted in his chest. They would not let him have his data, although he's had a little bit of progress recently, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Hugo tell his story now. Right, so, um, hi everyone. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with my story, I, I have, in fact, it's, a, it's an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, sort of one of those defibrillators that you see on TV for people who are at risk of a sudden cardiac arrest. And that's, I, I have a genetic heart muscle condition that puts me at risk of a sudden cardiac arrest. But nowadays, these devices are quite advanced, uh, pacemakers and uh, uh, implantable defibrillators and implantable loop recorders. Mm -hmm. These devices are able to be monitored remotely by the manufacturer of the device. And the data is pulled uh, mostly wirelessly. Uh, the device, they give you a box, you put it next to your bed, 
and uh, the device connects to the box wirelessly. The data is then transmitted to a uh, data warehouse that is managed and owned by the manufacturer of the device. It's not uh, something just with the manufacturer of my device, but all of the device, all the device manufacturers work in the same way. Now, this data is then made available to the physician or to the to clinicians um, in the form of reports. They, nobody has access to the raw data, so I couldn't really share it with anybody. I couldn't share it with researchers. Uh, I couldn't share it with. Uh, I couldn't share it with anyone. Uh, that I wish, even a for-profit company mm -hmm. or, or maybe a, a, a non-profit organization like maybe a Sage Bionetworks or mm -hmm. somebody that would help me provide some sort of analytics for a fee. Or I, in any case, the patient is kept out of the loop. The patient has no access to that information, to the, to the data whatsoever. Um, and uh, this is what I suppose what turned me yeah. into a loudmouth patient. When I realized that I have a device that keeps me alive, that's implanted in my own body, that is paid for on my behalf by my insurer, and yet I have no access to the data that it collects about me. The data is collected and stored by a manufacturer of, a, 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 of the device and kept siloed, and they are the only ones who benefit from that data. I thought, this is not right, and um, uh, we, we have to change this. Essentially, this is kind of... Uh, how I get to be <laughs> um, a loudmouth patient. And uh, in, a, in a sense, I think nowadays social media provides mm -hmm. patients with a platform that is yes. um, the, mm -hmm. similar to yeah. what a platform I don't like. think anybody wants to be a loudmouth patient. Right. Nobody wants to be a patient. I mean, right. nobody wants to have a right. serious health condition, but unfortunately, many of us have to, have to deal with them. And, right. You know, nobody got into this wanting to... Right. To get into it, right? No, yeah. and 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 being, I, I feel like being a loudmouth patient yeah. is kind of a way to kind of get myself engaged mm -hmm. and, and understanding my, my condition and yeah. actually being able to, uh, not to delve too far into this, but yeah. uh, patients, uh, I see my doctor for 15, uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, a visit every, every six months, and, yes. and I live with myself. All if anybody needs data, and he claims that he needs data to manage my condition, if anybody needs data, it's me. <laughs> I live with myself 30, 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, patients need to um, engage, okay. and, and, uh, right. and, and that's kind of yeah. the yeah. way it goes, okay. I think. And our next speaker, certainly Donna did not want to be in the position she's in. She's had you know, gastrointestinal problems for, for many years, and I believe it was last year you had a liver transplant. Was I'm it, actually 19 it? years post liver transplant You're 19 and years 30 post years with my diagnosis of inflammatory oh, bowel disease. 19 years post. Yes. Okay, I didn't realize that. But you've become a loudmouth patient uh, in part because you said that it's a little bit to do with your nature, a little bit to do with you know your background as a lawyer, and uh, also your husband is a physician. He'd like me to be quieter. He'd like, you, he'd, like, <laughs> he'd like you to be quieter, but I think that's true with a lot of doctors, and you know we have to you know understand that a lot of doctors are not going to be comfortable with patients speaking up on their behalf. Well, Donna is not comfortable with being silent on her own behalf when her health is, is at risk. And in fact, uh, she has a little news she's gonna share with us today. But why don't you go ahead and tell your story and we'll get right into that. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting being here at CES and the Digital Health Summit because I think so many of the people in the room and certainly people who in the room earlier certainly think of this as a business opportunity in a new market, and that's certainly true. Um, some may think of it as a, you know, technology revolution, and that's certainly true. But what I don't think people re recognize is that this is a civil rights movement. This is the new civil rights movement um, that you're a part of, and that mm -hmm. E-Patient Dave and Hugo and others are leading. And so as this movement matures, uh, we not only need loudmouth patients, and I don't actually think of myself as a loudmouth patient that may be delusional, but um, <laughs> I, I think of myself as insistent, persistent, mm -hmm. strategic, um, and you know, I, I am an attorney, so if this were back in the former civil rights movement, I might be the one who bailed other people out of jail. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm an attorney, so the approach I take to things as a patient, a patient advocate, and as the leader of a new nonprofit organization, a new patient advocacy organization, um, is really to help start to take the attention that's been generated, take the noise, the, the loudness, um, 
And that's both uh, online, uh, in online communities, in social media, in, for Regina's done a great job through her art advocacy in you know, general me media and in, in broadcast and print and everything and in murals in, you know, in DC. You know, that type of loudness, that type of getting attention, what needs to follow to really make this movement stick um, is uh, persistent uh, solution generation, to have a, a framework for uh, policy, for reimbursement, um, and patient advocates, uh, patients, patient advocates, and patient advocacy organization leaders are really essential to that. So if there's any takeaway from today, it's really that uh, patients are really essential to uh, making the innovation that people are creating um, possible and sustainable moving forward. So the announcement I have today is, you know, that um, you know later this month I will be launching a Global Liver Institute, which is intended to be a collaboration and innovation platform for the entire liver community, from children with biliary atresia all the way to uh, you know the half a billion people who have some form of viral hepatitis, um, and really get uh, the full force half of that on the public. Public health agenda. Half a billion people. With a B. With yeah, a B. That's astounding. Yes. So. And congratulations, by yeah. the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And our third speaker, Greg Matthews, who is in charge of digital media and social media at WCG consulting firm, has a little bit of news in that he's going to share some, some new research or some of his own you know, personal personal findings with us. He's not a a patient advocate in the sense of the other two panelists, but he certainly... I am a loudmouth, so yeah. I, I get it half right. Um, thank you. Uh, I am the, which one of these things is not like the other in this group, but uh, the reason that I am is because I, for the last several years, have been really inspired by what I see happening in social media on healthcare. Uh, and so the company that I work for, which is a marketing and communications firm, uh, has allowed me to pursue that passion, and now my job really is to help healthcare companies to engage productively, proactively in the health ecosystem. Uh, and a big part of that is about research. Uh, for the last several years, I've been focused on studying particularly physicians online and how doctors have come online uh, to really form their own kind of community, um, whether that is around advocacy, whether that is around continuing education, uh, there are all kinds of different reasons for that, um, but w to be able to understand that has been fascinating. And so we've found a, a mechanism for mapping uh, several thousand, about 15,000 physicians now in the U.S., uh, mapping their digital footprint and then being able to mine that data to understand how doctors feel and think and talk about certain subjects, how they interact with each other. And what I wanted to show today is a little bit of brand new research that's just beginning um, showing how patients and physicians are interacting online. I don't know if it's possible to click the link on that um, uh, slide there. What you're looking at here, um, and I know it's, it's a little bit hard to see here. I don't, it maybe can make a little bigger. But anyway, this is a, um, this is a visualization of about 90 prominent e-patients and the physicians that they are connected to and interacting with online. So, the yellow dots here are patients, the blue dots are physicians, and it's been really interesting to see when we take a close look at this chart, we can actually identify therapeutic areas. So we can see there's a breast, ca uh, breast cancer community uh, that's formed. We can see that there is a uh, heart health community, and it's actually uh, centered around Hugo, uh, in fact. So the Hugo icon is at, is, is at the center. Um, this chart is available. Uh, it's published on the web, uh, and I uh, uh, tweeted a link to it earlier today. But it's something that's been really fascinating to watch. And so I wanted to be able to represent sort of the, as we think about participatory medicine, uh, to perhaps share some of the things that I've learned from monitoring physicians who are very much involved in that participatory medicine movement. Okay. Well, the flip side of that is when patients speak up, doctors have always, you know, been held in high esteem, and you know they are very well educated people and very well respected for their, their you know, their profession is very well respected, and a lot of them feel challenged and don't like it when patients question them. They don't like it when other doctors question them sometimes. How do, how do you deal with that? Hugo, do you want to answer first? Or? Um, sure, sure. So um, 
I don't know. I mean, it, the way I deal with it is, um, is um, the way I deal with it is by, uh, to me, what matters is, is, is really being on top of, of my, my condition. My, one of my main concerns is a device malfunction. Yes. And, there, and so, uh, so I want to be on top of that. And that information or having access to knowledge and having access to information is crucial to that. You know, the doctors receive alerts. A patient, when, the device, when there's a device malfunction, mm -hmm. but the patient is not informed. So to me, it's, it's very important. And I spend, a lot of times I spend my vacation money on taking classes on how to uh, program implantable devices. And, mm -hmm. and, and what I'm trying to do is, and, and my doctors, some of them, and, and some of the nurses at where, where I get my care, mm -hmm. think of me as, uh, I, I think they, they say to me, I, you sh I should just relax. And, and I think the attitude of doctors is to, to hope that patients like me would just comply, consent, comply, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and just do, do as we're told. Um, but but in, my, in my experience, in my, in my view, what, what I want to do is really be on top of my, my uh, I lost my train of thought. I was going to say something about. Um, um, it was brilliant. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so this is the, the, the way, I, there is, there is it's, what's funny, what's interesting is that a lot of the doctors, that I, the, the, the providers of my care, a lot of times, we don't have as good a relationship yeah. as with some of the doctors that I'm connected to online. It's, and thank mm -hmm. you for putting, this is kind of interesting. Uh, you didn't mention that before, this year, <laughs> that you had that chart there. I'm curious to see. Uh, but in any case, uh, some of the, so nowadays I have, because, because I am connected with, and I, I talk about this stuff a lot, and, and, and I'm trying to raise my own level of health literacy. Mm -hmm. This is essentially what I'm trying yeah. to do. So I can have a, so I can partner with my doctor in a, in a, mm -hmm. a um, uh, effective way. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so I, I have relationships with physicians online. Mm -hmm. They're much better uh, than, than the, the relationships that I have with some of the, the doctors yeah. that provide my care, yeah. which is kind of sad, mm -hmm. right. um, but it's, it's uh, yeah. and I think there is a, 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 yeah. a, an intimidation kind of right. um, a, a aspect right. of it. Now I'm going to give you the unfiltered answer because I'm on East Coast time and so my body thinks it's sort of <laughs> closing in on 8 o'clock and my blood sugar is low. So my real answer is I have ceased to care if they are comfortable or mm -hmm. not um, with the type of patient that I am. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. get new doctors or um, mm -hmm. I work with other physicians within the hospital system higher up, frankly. Yeah. Um, I have conversations with vice presidents of medical affairs, VPs of quality and patient safety, um, so that their limitations are no longer mine. Yeah. And so they need to catch up. And mm -hmm. if that's a problem for them, that is their problem. Yeah, right. I no longer make it mine. Okay. So, you know, it, in reality, I have great relationships with most of my doctors, very, very close. We go out to dinner. Um, and in choosing a new doctor and choosing a new member of this team, and so I have you know, 10 different specialists in primary care. Um, additionally, you know, I really have to interview a doctor to understand you know, is he or she ready to engage in the type of medicine that I need to ensure and advance my health. So are they willing to be in a partnership with patients? Are they willing to, and I tell them straight out, you know, would it bother you if I, because I regularly do, go to a medical meeting, get CME. I probably have more CME credits than, uh, <laughs> than a, lot of, a lot of physicians. Um, you know, I read journals um, online and print since my husband is a physician and actually he's very supportive of me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I ask them straight out, are they comfortable with that type of patient? Are they comfortable with the type of interactions? Are they comfortable with the fact that I am generated data from different apps and devices, often trying new ones, um, and, and want to interact around uh, that patient-generated data? And if they're not, that, that's fine. That just means they're not the right doctor for mm -hmm. me. And so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, in the Society for Participatory Medicine, which is something that you all should, you know, know about and become members of, if this is an interest and inclination of you, have, you know, discussed the idea of a certain, you know, maybe not a, like a seal of approval or a seal that says, um, you know, this doctor uh, wants to engage and is, you know, qualified to engage in a participatory mm -hmm. Uh, you know, manner. And I think that that type of seal needs to be right up with the information that the folks at United talked about earlier in terms of how, you, how do you choose a doctor based on quality uh, measures and, and outcome and, and mortality rates, certainly. But I also think that this type of relationship 
is as important to you know, adherence, to understanding, to uh, not just fluffy things like you know, patient experience which, or patient satisfaction, which often is, you know, do they have valet parking in the color on the wall and do they pat you on the head yes. and talk to you nice, <laughs> but real patient engagement, patient experience, yeah. does that experience with the physician um, advance and improve your care? So a little logo that essentially shows or that they're e-patient friendly or right. something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that doctors are, and, and people themselves are more comfortable advocating on behalf, well, d doctors are more comfortable with the idea of patient advocates than, than they used to be, and there are people out there who are professional patient advocates, particularly for, for hospitalizations and complex cases. Uh, you know, but the advocacy tends to be by a family member. I think any parent would do anything they possibly could if it was their child in the hospital. And the same thing for uh, any adult if it were their elderly parents, you know, being mistreated in a nursing home, for example. People are not afraid to speak up when it's somebody close to them, but maybe are less likely to speak up when it's happening to themselves. And why, why do you think that might be? I think that's human nature. I think that, you know, it, it, as you said, it's much easier to advocate on cons of someone else for, for a loved one, and the role of caregivers really can't be, uh, you know, under, understated. And I think, actually, it's one of the reasons why the concept of the e-patient is still relatively new. It's a new movement mm -hmm. because we're sort of trained that it's not supposed to be all about us. And so I'm sure, you know, as we said earlier, nobody really wants to be mm -hmm. talking about themselves. and wants to be actively, you know, sharing their health problems, um, but it's perfectly okay and perfectly culturally acceptable to be mm -hmm. doing that on behalf of a loved one. Right. And so being a loudmouth patient, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek yeah. name, but it does, I mean, it represents something that you yeah. have to overcome. Right. Uh, because unless it's your nature just yeah. to want to poke tigers all the time, right. which yeah. I, I suppose some people have that in their yeah. nature, right. It's, it's not a normal thing. You think right. social media might be changing that? Because people are sharing a lot more than they used to on, you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on you know, maybe some of the newer social networks like uh, you know, Instagram or, or Vine. Or I, I don't even know what uh, you know, teenagers th not, no longer think that Facebook is cool anymore. They've moved on. Uh, Snapchat, for example. Uh, people share everything, and they share things that could probably you know, might otherwise turn out to be embarrassing. Uh, you know, a lot of you know, embarrassing pictures, that sort of thing. But um, people seem to be more open to sharing um, health information when they're sick, you know, on social media, maybe with just their friends or maybe to the, to the world if it's on Twitter, for example. I think that more people, knowing that there are other people like you mm -hmm. who have the condition, um, makes you feel you know, less, less alone and mm -hmm. more able to speak up. And also, when you learn about, you know, hey, they have a different protocol at another institution, it gives you, you know, questions or fodder for conversations mm -hmm. with your doctor. Hey, can we try this? I know at University X they're, they're doing yeah. this and some patients are receiving. So it gives you information to be able to, you know, feed back to your doctor. So that's helpful, too, okay. in understanding what should I be loud about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and honestly, when social media started happening, um, I was working in an insurance company, and I think if anybody out there works for a healthcare company, you'll back me up on this. Hmm. You know, in 2007, conventional wisdom was people are not going to share health information online. It's way too personal, way too private, um, and the truth is that that was 100% mm -hmm. wrong, and the reason it's 100% wrong is because people are willing to make an exchange for value, right? right. I mean, privacy mm -hmm. is great, but... Uh, if there is value to be achieved by sharing information, then by all means. Right. Well, you know, in my, in my experiences, you know, and I'm, I'm the, the, the person who, who is, uh, the, the, maybe one, one day I'll regret this, but I, <laughs> I, I have the least amount of concern with privacy. I, mm -hmm. I post my electrocardiograms yes. online and uh, reports from my device. And so uh, it's all there. But I think what happens is, uh, 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 the, 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 for the most part, uh, physicians are really unavailable mm -hmm. to have uh, a conversation with patients to help um, elevate the patient and educate. And, and so what, what happens is that by, naturally, patients uh, end up connecting with one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, we share um, um, our health information on these uh, social networks. Yeah. And uh, patients are really learning from each other. This has been happening for, for years. 
And um, uh, patients essentially, at the end of the day, only have each other yes. uh, to share uh, and we and to share this information and learn from. Um, and 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 this is this is what's happening. I mm -hmm. think it's it's fascinating. And by, by by putting reports online and electrocardiograms and things like that, even on Facebook, uh, there there are groups on Facebook where you can post an electrocardiogram yes. and people will chime in and. And crowdsource. We can yeah. crowdsource the results of what you think that right. the, the, that yeah. arrhythmia is. That's it's true. fascinating. It's really cool. Yeah. And so things are changing. But uh, maybe uh, at one point um, I'll regret. Um, <laughs> my my concern nowadays is not with privacy. Is with control over my data and access. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Looks like somebody down there. Down over here. Yeah. Bring the microphone. Yeah. I, um, I think they're re they're recording this. Bettina, I know Bettina is could be a loud mouth too, right? <laughs> is that? <laughs> I don't know whether uh, loud mouth is, hmm. but um, I've had a chronic illness for about forty years, hmm. and um, you know it's always a learning experience. Doctors, hmm. you know. I mean, giving doctors credit, uh, we don't know. You know, they've, they've been taught something and it's a learning curve for them as well. But I unfortunately have seen a lot of people get a lot of terrible, terrible care because, you know, doctors just don't know and they, you know, went into the medical business with, you know, many years ago with the guys that, you know, they were, you know, you, they yeah. knew everything and you knew nothing and, yeah. you know, so my, uh, I've been through a lot, uh, you know, where I had to deal with uh, doctors because they, you know, I'm not a cookie cutter patient at all. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there is such thing as a cookie cutter right, patient, but, unless, uh, you ha unless you have, you know, something basic like the They're called the consumers. Yeah. It, it, Thank you. Right. <laughs> yes, but thank you. So, um, but still, you know, every time I have a problem, I run into doctors who go, okay, paragraph one, page two. So it is, in. Um, Your question is, Bettina? Yeah. You, you have limited time. Oh, that's not Bettina. I was okay. mistaken, mm -hmm. but I'm sorry. Well, you, you, but, yeah. you mentioned mm -hmm. it's a revolution. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. I believe that patients are becoming more and more active and online with, you know, patients like uh, us and, you know, all mm -hmm. sorts of uh, other, uh, uh, to get information about their own illnesses. Is there anything being done on the doctor's side to make them more aware that, you know, and, and I don't know. If, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and yeah. actually I, I know the that that's, yeah. that's my yeah. real yeah. question, yeah. you know. I mean, patients are, talking about being loudmouth patients, you know, and yeah. we talked about a symbol for a doctor, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, that's great because you know, we're starting to interview doctors. Uh, now. We're, we're running out of time, so do you want to uh, do that's, that? That's yes, my yeah, no, yeah. It's, a, it's a great question, and just very quickly, I think, um, you know, we're, I mentioned that we're tracking over 15,000 doctors in the U.S. alone who are using Twitter which is really quite remarkable. And I think we're probably going to you know, get up to 50,000 by the time that we're done. Um, but what I've seen is that a number of leading medical schools now have communication programs built into their curriculum that are focused on social communications and being able to learn effectively from patients. And so I know that there are at least the beginnings of those kind of movements afoot. I know actually there are several doctors in the room here uh, who are very active in those kind of communities and could probably speak uh, even in more detail to that, to that question. Excellent. Well, I'm sorry that we're all out of time, but that was, that's great. And I was really, really excited to be able to bring this topic to the show this year. Thanks, uh, I really thank you guys. Thank you. And Neil, I thank you for uh, kind of inspiring me to do it. So oh. thank you.